Go boldly and honestly through the world. Learn to love the fact that there is nobody else quite like you. This is exciting. Yes, it is exciting. This is a chance to ask each other. Then you can be the hero of your own story. Then Go for camera. it. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Eloquence and passion, as opposed to fear and ignorance. J.K. Rowling has tweeted concerns about the gender debate using very gracious language. Still, she's been labelled with all sorts of phobias. The classic response from people who don't know how and don't care to defend their views with actual arguments. Harry Potter, Daniel Radcliffe, is obviously a believer in the logical fallacy guilt by association because in interviews with totally objective and truth-seeking companies, he found it necessary to publicly denounce Rowling's tweets and state the obvious facts that not everybody in the franchise shares her beliefs. I don't think I would have been able to look myself in the mirror had I not said anything, as he dramatically but yet heroically put it. When comparing one of Radcliffe's speeches to his interview statements, there are several noteworthy discrepancies that expose who Radcliffe is, who he really is. In the description to his speech, we are told to join us in exploring Daniel Radcliffe's insightful perspectives on heroism, courage and acting. I'm always interested in exploring insightful perspectives, so let's see if Radcliffe can teach us something new. As an Englishman, a certain amount of natural reserve prevents me from being totally comfortable with the notion of being called a hero. Um, I still can't quite wrap my head around it. Yet he's there, accepting the award. Maybe that's why he says he's not totally comfortable, meaning that he is comfortable, just not totally. Also, is he insinuating that you have to be an Englishman to have this natural reserve? If so, it sounds rather discriminating to use the terminology that people like Radcliffe use against people they disagree with. When I think of heroes, my schoolboy mind can't help but take over, and I think of everyone from my personal sporting heroes, English cricketers like Freddie Flintoff, to um, Alexander the Great, you know, leading his army to victory. Actually, Alexander the Not-So-Great did more than that. He engaged in brutal tactics to maintain control and instill fear. The number of people he disposed of, to put it mildly, wasn't limited to perceived enemies, but also friends and advisors. So I'm not sure I know, you know. Alexander the Great, you know. Interesting that someone as loving as Radcliffe would name Alexander a hero, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Next, we get an initial insight into how he thinks, disguised as humor. Um, incidentally, Considering that Alexander was bisexual, perhaps next year Trevor could honour him in some way, given that no one has actually done more for gays in the military. Um, <laughs> Did his own joke make him nervous? Um, <laughs> With this joke, Radcliffe says a lot more than he'd like people to notice, because the connection he makes is exactly how organisations work today. They're focused on people's innate characteristics and preferences, so-called. That's the basis on which you win awards today. I'm a feminist! I kissed a girl and I liked it. Truth be told, A, I did more than that. Hold up! Many of the people I admire belong to the LGBTQ community. They are trusted allies that provide a safe space this excerpt speaks volumes about Radcliffe's remarkable lack of discernment. People are heroes because of surface-level things like preferences. I'll get back to his intentional lack of critical thinking. However, sporting, sporting personalities aside, those kind of all-conquering, world-defining heroes are harder and harder to come by as the world gets bigger. All-conquering heroes. That's a good thing. To have all-conquering and world-defining heroes run things. I wonder what this dream world looks like from our hero's perspective. Maybe something like this. Has all of the male physical characteristics, so can, couldn't we plainly say this person is a male? Well, wh well I guess it's, it's like, wh why are you asking the question? I, well, I mean, I think when someone tells you who they are, you should believe them. It, it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me. Um, and, if you, and, and if you keep probing, we're going to stop the interview. You keep invoking the word truth which is condescending and rude. Charismatic individuals who use eloquence and passion as opposed to fear and ignorance as the tools they use to shape events are often unable even to be heard above the din of media mediocrity and people-pleasing politicians. Yes, because Radcliffe would never dream of being people-pleasing, exactly like politicians. 
Let's explore some of our heroes' insightful perspectives in interviews with renowned companies that share his passion for truth. It was really important, as I've worked with the Trevor Project for more than 10 years, and so I don't think I would have been able to look myself in the mirror had I not said anything. So, what was important to him? Was reality important to him? Was truth important to him? No, his association with the Trevor Project was important to him. He goes on, but it's not mine to guess what's going on in someone else's head. Yet he also states, I wanted them to know that not everybody in the franchise felt that way. And that was really important. The words felt that way should be noted. These words show that he does try to guess what's going on in someone else's head, namely Rowling's head. Otherwise, there'd be nothing to distance himself from. So far, eloquence and passion don't quite make up for our hero's logic. Use eloquence and passion. Yet, things are about to get even more people-pleasing and distance-taking. To all the people who now feel that their experience of the books has been tarnished or diminished, I'm deeply sorry for the pain these comments have caused you. Yes, because there's nothing like trying to shut down a civil debate about the postmodern phenomenon of gender identity by appealing to people's emotion and pity pathos. And that's exactly what our hero is doing here, which is surprising to me, considering that he's a hero. What he really should be worried about is the animosity towards Rowling. She expressed her personal opinions, something which is still allowed, perhaps to Radcliffe's dismay, and they had nothing to do with the Harry Potter franchise. What do anyone's legal personal opinions have to do with their work? Who will be targeted next? Radcliffe the Great certainly won't be the one stopping the attacks, quite the contrary. And to show that he doesn't accept discussion about his unsubstantiated claims, he says this. Transgender women are women. Any statement to the contrary erases the identity and dignity of transgender people and goes against all advice given by professional healthcare associations who have far more expertise on this subject matter than either Joe or I. He's resting his entire case on an argument from authority that literally anyone can use about any matter as it's always possible to find a perceived authority to support your claims. With any statement to the contrary, he's ruling out any discussion, which again is surprising to me considering how inclusive he is. So is he motivated by truth? Is he looking at reality? No, he goes with whatever definitions healthcare associations go by in our zeitgeist, as if that's an honest way of arguing. In that sense, his intentionally shaming language, erasing the identity and dignity, makes sense. He can't be bothered to make actual arguments, so he goes straight to a tactic that's designed to make people who disagree with him, even the slightest, feel bad about it. This kind of authoritarianism is in line with his heroic ideals. Um, Alexander the Great, all-conquering, world-defining heroes. According to our hero, all people should just sit by and watch, as the medical professionals teach us all what to think no matter how bad the logic or lack thereof is. Some children figure out their gender really early. And how I put it in words for kids so that they can understand it is, tell me your story. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Where are you right now? Santa Claus is real for them, but yeah. Santa Claus is not actually real. To that child, they are. Male gametes. That's what makes me male. No. In truth. Okay. Whose truth are we talking about? Identity. So we assign female to chickens when they lay eggs? That's a, we that's... assume they're female if they lay eggs. Puberty blockers are wonderful because we can put that pause on puberty. Just like if you were listening to music. This is all fine according to Radcliffe. And if you oppose it, you're erasing people's identity and dignity. His co-star, Tom Felton, has only made matters worse. I'm pro-choice, pro-discussion, pro-human rights across the board, and pro-love and anything that is not those things, I don't really have much time for. He's pro-discussion, he just doesn't have time for discussion. Yes, totally sounds like someone who's pro-discussion. The adverb really detracts from his claim to not have time for discussion. He does have time for discussion, just not really, whatever that's supposed to mean, nothing of course. What does being pro-love look like when you share his opinions and anything else is hate? The very definition of deceptive language is undefined presuppositions and virtue signaling. So in that regard, Felton succeeds. It's ironic to hear Radcliffe talk about charismatic individuals that aren't heard, when the truth is that it's only people who share his beliefs that are heard. Thus, it's actually people like him that are part of the media mediocrity. 
and he doesn't even see that, or maybe he does, and he just hopes that no one else does. And what beliefs are we talking about here? It's hard to tell, because he speaks in cliches like passion and fear and ignorance, without defining what the terms mean. This is deliberate vagueness, because it's when you start going into specifics that disagreement occurs, and we can't have disagreement at an inclusive event like this. No, let's stick to the platitudes we know so well. But the truth is that a hero is not always the person rallying the troops for battle or leading a march against oppression. A hero is also someone who, in their day-to-day -day interactions with the world, despite all the pain, uncertainty and doubt that can plague us, is resiliently and unashamedly themselves. And rallying the troops for battle. It appears that he really does consider warlords to be heroes. What if that comment causes someone pain? I don't know about you, but I'm offended. Aside from the implicit self-praise, how he wants the audience to perceive him, it's worth noting that he praises people for being themselves, while also making the accusation that any statement to the contrary erases the identity and dignity. I'm sure Rowling was being herself when she posted her very mild comments. So again, apparently it's perfectly okay to resiliently and unashamedly be yourself, as long as you have the right people-pleasing opinions. Not even our hero's attempts at effective prosody, manipulating his voice to convey emotion and conviction, is resiliently and unashamedly can make up for these inconsistencies. And next, there are more insightful perspectives in store for us. If you can wake up every day and be emotionally open and honest regardless of what you get back from the world, then you can be the hero of your own story. The hero of my own story? That's a cliché I haven't heard in a while. I particularly like how specific and thus meaningful it is. He values being emotionally open and honest. Really. I guess he should have reminded himself of this before doing the interviews where he was neither open to his enemies' viewpoints or honest in his argumentation. Regardless of what you get back from the world, he says. It sounds like he's talking about rolling because he sure got a lot back from the world. From Radcliffe's kind of world. But then again, there's a reason why she's not the one receiving an award like this. She's on the fear and ignorance side, and Radcliffe's on the eloquence and passion side. Eloquence and passion, as opposed to fear and ignorance. And each and every person who can say, despite life's various buffetings, that they are proud to be the person they are, is a hero. Really? That's the only criteria for being a hero. What about dictators, then? I'm sure they've experienced buffetings, but are proud of who they are. Once again, Radcliffe's intentional lack of discernment, his lack of courage to engage in honest argumentation, is on full display. However, even with his shortcomings on full display, that doesn't stop him from implicitly praising his own heroic qualities. Um, as I said earlier, I think honesty is the most heroic quality one can aspire to. Is this the kind of honesty like when he in all seriousness made an argument from authority to end all discussion? It's ironic how honesty is so much on his mind when his own approach to argumentation has so little of it. Maybe he knows he can't live up to his own ideals. And next, it's time for the brave finale, as the effective prosody is about to reach its peak. Go boldly and honestly through the world. Learn to love the fact that there is nobody else quite like you. Um, and you will be, to plagiarize and paraphrase all at once, the heroes of your own lives. Um, I thank the Trevor Project for this amazing award. Um, at least he's being honest about the plagiarizing part, which really means intentionally meaningless repetition. Can all people go boldly and honestly through the world according to our hero? Should all people love the fact that there's no one quite like them? If you share his opinions, yes. If not, you're erasing people's identity and dignity. I wonder if all of this is Radcliffe's way of saying that he wants to be the next Alexander the Great because he doesn't want to be seen as Harry Potter all his life. That would explain his dishonest virtue signaling, that he wants to become a member of the Bosworth Club for money and attention. In the following, I play a few clips from a conversation that Radcliffe had with Rowling before he accused her of being an eraser of people's identity and dignity. We've seen how two-faced his claims and accusations are, but could he also be two-faced as a person? What do you think about this conversation? How are you? Not bad at all, but I just tread on you. No, 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 not at all. Please have a seat. Excellent. So, this is exciting. Yes, it is exciting. This is our chance to ask each other 
What All the you... things we've asked each other off camera, but now do it in front of the but camera. But now do it in exactly front of the camera, yeah. absolutely. Right from the beginning, there's a difference in how they conduct themselves, with Radcliffe being overly polite, extremely self-aware, and displaying nervous energy, and Rowling being calm as the obvious authority in the conversation. Rowling obviously senses that he's not resiliently and unashamedly being himself, because she tries to calm him. So um, I was, yeah, no, this is, this is, this is uh, my chance where I realised that doing the interviewing is actually not an easy thing to do at all. That's okay, we can swap, I can interview yeah, you. Yeah, 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 that would be brilliant. Um... To use a word like brilliant about a fairly standard suggestion doesn't sound overcompensating at all. Try, and I'm going to try and be much more uh, profound and insightful than I ever have been Go off camera. Go for it, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um... That word insightful again. I've absolutely no doubt that he's going to say something profound. His speech and interview statements have made it clear that there's much to learn from his complex arguments and multifaceted observations. However, his performance here doesn't seem entirely convincing, so I'm curious. How did he get the role in the first place? Will you say how you were found? Well, it, it was just, inc it was amazing, really. It's, it was a bizarre kind of moment. I'm, originally, what had happened was that David Heyman, the producer, yeah. Yeah, um, knew my dad because my dad had been a literary agent. Yeah. Um, and my dad had worked with David's mum. And so David sort of asked my dad if I would audition. There's nothing like making it, only because of your raw talent. In the following, Rowling shares the deep feelings she has for Radcliffe. The feelings and respect that Radcliffe hasn't shown towards Rowling. And then the first time I ever saw you was on screen in my sitting room at home. Really? They, yeah, they sent me a video of you. But um, so I saw you on um, that audition tape and it was, I, ha I don't think I've ever really told you that I found incredibly moving. Oh, thank you so and, much. And of course, almost, I mean, it was incredibly moving. At that point, I didn't have a son. Oh, right. Yeah. So, and I phoned David up. And I said, he's, um, he, he's, he's great, he's fantastic. And I, rem I did say to David, it was like watching a son, my son on screen. Because after all, Harry felt like, feels like this ghostly son that I've had in my life. But you know, to be honest, you <laughs> and Rupert and Emma are all too good looking, frankly. Oh. You are, you know. Ratcliffe has the right reactions at the right times, making him seem well-mannered and humble, overly eager to please. Thank you, sir. So and and oh, right. Frankly. Oh. However, as we've also seen, there's a very different side to him, one that he can't keep privately, but finds it necessary for the world to see for perceived self benefit, apologizing to all the people who now feel that their experience of the books has been tarnished or diminished, as if he owns the franchise that a friend of the family gave him the lead role in. This shows that even self-effacing behavior isn't always a good sign, or at the very least not a sign that the person won't accuse you of bad things later on. He continues with the right reactions that seem very overcompensating. Do you know what, it was really lucky I spoke to Emma first on the phone before I met her, because I fell absolutely in love with her. She spoke for like, <laughs> like 60 seconds at least without drawing breath, and I just said, Emma, you're perfect. And who is Emma? Someone who's also profound and insightful, I'm guessing. And the UN Women's Global Goodwill Ambassador. I started questioning gender-based assumptions a long time ago. I was confused being called bossy because I wanted to direct the plays that we would put on for our parents. But the boys were not. Women are choosing not to identify as feminist. It is time that we all perceive gender on a spectrum. Rowling sure knows how to surround herself with the right kind of people who totally aren't saying things to rub shoulders with the more prominent members of the Buzzword Club. Rowling shows empathetic skills, asking Radcliffe elaborating questions and making encouraging remarks along the way. And unlike Radcliffe, she does it in a calm and natural manner. In America, they treat you first and foremost as a star and then as a child. Do you think you had any idea that young of what, what, it, what you were really taking on? Do you... I mean, I'd, I'd had the first two read to me by my dad, who incidentally did a great basilisk voice. Did he? Um, yeah, fantastic back in the day. I did actually at one point. I can actually imagine your dad doing that. Yeah, my dad. Um, <laughs> in my, uh, I, oh, but no, so I was, sweet. I was, um, no, I don't think I could have ever had any, and even now, I don't actually think I have 
an understanding of how far it reaches because it is a case of not being able to see the wood for the trees. And considering his way of arguing, it appears that he still can't see the wood for the trees. Being 34 years old, he can no longer use his age as an excuse. If you liked the video, feel free to resiliently click the like button. See you next time.